Eh. Cioè, lo sfondo è bellissimo, eh. ora lo chiudo, ma lo sfondo è stupendo. <ride> ok, allora vai Marco, per me ho messo a registrare, possiamo... Eh, mi, se- mi senti? Mi se- sì? Sì, sì. Ok, uh, I guess we can switch to English, we have a few guests. We are glad to continue our complex analysis seminar on, online. And uh, today's speaker is uh, Filippo Bracci, who will talk about Gromov hyperbolicity in several complex variables, if I remember correctly. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and I would like to say that uh, we are scheduled a, a, a seminar next week, uh, May 14th, uh, by Nikos Chomukis. And uh, the following uh, Thursday, uh, May 14th, 21st uh, by Gian Maria Dallara. And uh, I also would like to say that at the end, uh, we, we would like to, to thank the speaker. And so we'll uh, open up the, the microphone again so we can make uh, a clap if you wish. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, thank so. you, Marco. Um, okay, so let me. Uh, okay, let me. Pass to the uh, just a second. Here it is. Okay, so I what I want to do is to give uh, a sketch on uh, how. Uh, just a second. Let me. Okay. Let me. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You haven't shared the screen yet. Yes, I'm. Uh, I'm going to do okay. Just a second. Can you see the screen? Yes. Now we can. Okay. Good. So I going just okay. So what what I'm going to do is to um, mainly to give uh, a, an idea of how uh, this um, uh, Gromov hyperbolicity theory can be used in complex analysis to solve. Uh, uh, some problems, uh, some old and new problem. And uh, as you see here, I'm just uh, uh, going to uh, to cite some uh, recent result of mine with other uh, uh, friends and uh, uh, co-authors, uh, Manuel Contreras, Santiago Diaz Madrigal, Hervé Gossier and uh, Andy Zimmer, and also Oliver Roth, uh, Maria Curu and Davide uh, Cordella. Um, so here is, uh, is a list of paper that uh, in all these uh, results, uh, we, we are using uh, uh, some instances of uh, Gromov hyperbolicity to solve problem in complex analysis. So the aim of this uh, talk is just to try to give you a, an idea of uh, what is uh, uh, needed and what we, we can use from uh, Gromov uh, hyperbolicity. Also, uh, le- let me make uh, a first commercial. Uh, I just end up this book together with uh, Manuel Contreras and Santiago Diaz Madrigal about continuous semigroup of holomorphic uh, self-map of the unit disk. It's about uh, 600 pages, but there are two chapters, chapter five and chapter six, uh, mainly chapter six, uh, where we uh, revise and uh, in fact, we prove all details about Gromov hyperbolicity in uh, simply connected domain OC. So if you are interested, just uh, write to me and I can send you a PDF version of the of the book and the, the paper you can find on my web page. So let me start by uh, recalling on, uh, or uh, if you don't know, by see what uh, a gram of hyperbolic space is. So here we are just talk about uh, coarse geometry. We have uh, a, a XD is a metric space. And uh, um, and then uh, uh, we we say that uh, a, a curve from the uh, from an interval in R to um, maybe open up a little bit to to X uh, is a geodesic if it is an isometry uh, between the Euclidean metric and uh, uh, the the metric of the space. So in uh, if I give this definition, of course, uh, uh, I'm taking uh, the uh, arc length parametrization of geodesic. So if I talk uh, of geodesic like this, is uh, uh, with comes with parametrization. Uh, if this uh, interval is uh, a finite inter- interval, then we call this a geodesic segment. If it is uh, a half line, then we call it uh, a geodesic ray. And if it is uh, the entire uh, real line, we call it the geodesic line. Um, now, a metric space is called uh, proper if every closed ball uh, is compact in the space. 
and it's geodesic if you can join uh, every two point uh, by a geodesic segment. So, um, of course, in my, in uh, essentially, in all cases, I'm going to consider in complex analysis, uh, I will uh, end up working with a metric space, which is uh, both proper and geodesic. Uh, and here comes the definition of Gromov. So we have uh, a geodesic metric space and we call uh, a geodesic triangle is uh, any, um, any triangle whose uh, edges are formed by uh, geodesic segments. So let me make here uh, downstairs a picture for you. So here uh, it's I, I take three points. So it, since if my metric space is uh, um, is geodesic, it means that I can uh, uh, glue these uh, uh, three points uh, two by two by a geodesic segment. Maybe there are more than one. Okay, maybe these are not unique. So there might be other geodesic. Okay, this is called a geodesic triangle. So a geodesic triangle is uh, is just the data of three points uh, and three um, geodesic uh, uh, interval which join the three points. Okay, I um, I call this uh, uh, proper geodesic metric space. I call Grom of hyperbolicity if uh, every uh, geodesic triangle is delta t. What does it mean delta t? Means that uh, if I take a, a delta um, neighborhood. If I take any, let, let me make the, the picture a little bit bigger. So I have uh, this picture here. And now if I take uh, any, th there exists a delta, a given uh, number delta positive, so that whenever I have uh, a geodesic triangle, no matter which one, if I consider a delta neighborhood uh, of uh, one edge and then of the, and the, of the other edge, Okay, then uh, the the third edge is contained in these two neighborhoods. So here, what I'm going to do is uh, I take this uh, neighborhood. Uh, this is a delta neighborhood of uh, this uh, geodesic interval here. So this is made by all points which stay a distance less than delta from uh, the point. So here, uh, in in this set here, there are the points z in X uh, such that uh, the distance z and uh, uh, I, let's call, uh, is less than delta, where I is uh, this guy here. Okay, so there's a delta neighborhood of one side. Then I take uh, the delta neighborhood of the another side, this one, and then it turns out that the third side is containing the union of these two ne delta neighborhood. If this happens for any geodesic triangle, then uh, we say that the metric space is uh, delta Gromov uh, hyperbolic. And usually we don't uh, consider delta. I mean, uh, delta enters, of course, in some, uh, uh, in some results about Gromov space, uh, hyperbolic space, but th then we say that the space is Gromov hyperbolic if it is delta Gromov hyperbolic. So it means that there exists this delta such that any geodesic triangle is delta t in the sense that uh, given uh, you take any two edges and the third one is containing a delta neighborhood of the two previous one. Okay, so this is the definition of a Gromov of hyperbolic uh, space. Now, if we have uh, a, um, a Gromov of uh, uh, hyperbolic space, we can consider, we, we fix a point x naught in x, a base point, and as you can imagine, this point has uh, really no meaning at all in uh, all this construction. And we consider uh, the, the space, or in fact, I would say the set of all geodesic ray um, steaming from uh, X naught. So it means that, uh, where, and here the, it becomes a topological space, uh, given the topology of uniform convergence on compacta for the geodesic. So this means that I keep uh, this point uh, X naught, and then I, I, I consider all possible geodesic uh, coming out from uh, this point uh, X naught, all geodesic rays. Okay, so they, they go up to, to infinity. And here uh, it makes, uh, I make it uh, a, um, a topological space by uh, declaring that uh, uh, a geodesic, a sequence of geodesic ray converge to a geodesic ray if it does uh, uniformly on uh, compact, okay? They all start from X naught and they all are geodesic, so we have this. And now I give uh, a, a, an equivalence relation on this space by saying in that two geodesic rays are equivalent if uh, the distance is bounded. So when you go to infinity, 
when you when you go to infinity here let me let me make a, a, an example for you which is this uh, um let, let me make this this example which is one of the basic example is the unit disk with the poincare distance i will talk a little later about this uh here uh, we know that uh, the, for the hyperbolic distance uh, the segment here is a geodesic but there are other geodesic uh, arriving to the point one which are uh, all uh, arc of a circle uh, which are orthogonal uh, to, to the boundary of the unit disk here in this point. Now, this is not a good example because the, the, the starting point of the, this geodesic is different, but still, um, if, if you want, you, you see that uh, here you can uh, take a parameterization of this geodesic and this geodesic in such a way that the hyperbolic distance of these two is, uh, is bounded. Uh, so this is not, I mean, uh, this tell what 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 means that the geodesic have uh, uh, bounded distance. Okay, so in the unit disk, uh, if you fix, for instance, the, the point uh, zero, then there is uh, uh, only one geodesic which goes to the point one, which is this one, and then all geodesic ray coming out from zero are this one, and they have uh, all infinite distance. So each uh, geodesic uh, corresponds to exactly one uh, equivalence class. Okay, um, then I, I define the uh, Gromov boundary of uh, um, the Gromov boundary. Uh, what happens here? The Gromov boundary of a metric space uh, is exactly this space uh, endowed with the uh, quotient topology. So we take the quotient of these two. And the Gromov uh, closure of X is just the uh, disjoint union of X with the Gromov boundary. Now we can give uh, a topology on this closure set to have a global topology. And how to do that? Uh, here is the, the formal definition. So what we do, I, let, let me sketch here what we do in uh, uh, just with, with the picture. So we have uh, uh, this space. So here uh, we have uh, our space. Let's say here is uh, X naught. So we have a sequence of point. Zn, and we want to say what does it mean that this uh, sequence of points Zn they do converge uh, to the class gamma, where uh, gamma is a geodesic ray coming out from x naught. And uh, um, so, so what we do, we consider geodesic from x naught to the point uh, Zn, like this. Okay, we call this gamma n, and what we ask is that uh, this sequence of geodesic uh, um, segments converge uniformly on compacta to a geodesic ray which represents the Gromov uh, boundary point. Okay, so this is the this is the idea. In uh, in the unit disk, uh, if you if you look to the example of the unit disk, uh, so here we have uh, um, the unit disk, and uh, let's say we we, we consider. Uh, zero is the base point so we have uh, this segment which is a geodesic for the hyperbolic metric and now if we have uh, a sequence of point here converging to one then we can consider these segments and you see that these segments here are converging uh, uniformly on compacta in the end to this geodesic and from this picture you you might infer that in fact for the unit disk if you consider the gromov topology of the unit disk with the hyperbolic uh, the Poincaré distance, then uh, the, uh, the, to the Gromov topology and the uh, Euclidean topology are the same. So they, they are uh, homeomorphic because you have a sequence of points converging, let's say, to this point one, if and only if uh, these uh, geodesic segments converge to this geodesic, which is uh, the only one which lands at one. I will come back a little bit later. So in any in any case, you can give uh, a gram of uh, a, if you have a gram of hyperbolic space, you can give uh, a topology, and this makes uh, and this is going to be a, um, a metrizable topology, uh, and so in particular, it's also um, Hausdorff and compact uh, and give a compact space. But this is not something that I'm using a lot. In I mean, I never use the fact that the space is compact. Uh, what is very, very important to me is uh, the so-called uh, shadowing lemma. So what is the shadowing lemma? Shadowing lemma tells the following. Um, 
I take two uh, metric space X with the with the metric dx and y with the metric dy, and uh, two constant a greater or equal than one and b greater or equal than zero. Then I say that uh, a, a map from I to X is an AB quasi geodesic if this equality holds. So in other terms, what does this equality mean? This means that if I do have A equal to one and B equal to zero, then from here we see that the map is just uh, a geodesic. Here it's not a geodesic, but because I have some freedom, I, I can say that the distance is essentially like t minus a, s, but up to a constant a and one over a here and b here. b, in fact, doesn't play any role, but it's good because it can contain the compact part of any curve. If, um, for instance, if you have a compact curve inside the metric space, this is always uh, a uh, one b quasi geodesic with b the diameter uh, of the curve. So it's, uh, I mean, it, it, so, so it means that for compact curve, uh, if you just take a curve, then th this is not really a good definition. But as it turns out, as I will hope to, to show you, it's, uh, it's going to be really a strong definition. Um, a second one, uh, if I do have a map from X to Y, this is uh, an AB quasi isometry, if it does exactly as before, except that now instead of taking the, the metric in the um, Euclidean uh, line, I'm just taking the metric in the first space uh, X. OK, so I do have this. Uh, OK, some uh, remark, uh, uh, an AB quasi geodesic is just an AB quasi isometry from uh, the from I, this uh, real interval into the space uh, XD. Uh, whenever F is bijective and it's a quasi isometry, then also the inverse is a quasi isometry. And uh, um, Moreover, if uh, uh, it's a quasi isometry, which is also a bijection, then uh, uh, it preserves Gromov of hyperbolicity. So Gromov of hyperbolicity in the category of uh, Gromov of hyperbolic space, uh, the arrows uh, are given exactly by quasi by um, bijective uh, quasi isometry. And moreover, when you have uh, a Gromov of hyperbolic space, uh, then uh, if you have uh, a, a a, uh, a quasi a bijective uh, quasi isometry, then it extends uh, as an homeomorphism between the closure of the two. So, so in particular, this means that uh, if you have an isometry between two metric space, and these are Gromov hyperbolic, then it always extends uh, as an homeomorphism between the closure of the two Gromov uh, hyperbolic space. Okay, uh, so as I said, uh, this is probably the most uh, uh, powerful tool in uh, Gromov uh, hyperbolic space, which is the so-called shadowing lemma. Shadowing lemma tells that if you have uh, a um, quasi geodesic, okay, no matter if you have here an, an AB quasi geodesic, then there exists a, uh, a certain R which depends only on A and B not on the curve, so that uh, in uh, our neighborhood uh, of this curve, it contains uh, the geodesic joining the starting and end point of the curve. So this means that, um, it, why is important this shadowing lemma? Because in general, uh, finding geodesic of a space is very, very complicated. It means that you really know the metric, but it might be easier, and in fact, it is easier to find the quasi geodesic and whenever you are given uh, a quasi geodesic, sh the shadowing lemma tells that the geodesic starting from the same point and arriving at the same point is not very far from your quasi geodesic. And in fact, it stay in a finite uh, neighborhood, which depends only on A and B. So that's the one of the basic uh, result of Gromov and the, it's the so-called shadowing lemma. Um, there is another condition which I, which people call visibility condition which is the following. Um, if we do have, uh, a, then, then we, we can, uh, I can just uh, say in this line, geodesic in Gromov hyperbolic space is bent inside. What does it mean? It means that uh, if you have uh, a Gromov hyperbolic space, and if you have two points on the Gromov boundary, okay, this, this is an abstract boundary, 
is a visual boundary, but if you take two points in this uh, abstract boundary, then there exists a compact set which depends only on the two points, so that whenever we have two sequences in X which converge one to this point uh, uh, C and the other eta, of course these two points are different, okay, they, they are not the same. Um, then if we have these two sequences converging one to X and the other to eta, then the geodesic from a certain point on, the geodesic we join Zn with uh, Wn, they uh, intersect uh, the compact set K. So here is the picture, I have eta and uh, um, C, and the, the sequence Zn converging to eta, Wn converging to C. So if I consider the geodesic joining Zn with Wn, and the next one, all of this geodesic should intersect uh, a fixed uh, compact set K, which depends only on eta and uh, so it means that the geodesic bends inside. Okay, um, well, let's look to a uh, couple of results that uh, um, about this uh, gromo hyperbolic space. So the first result is by uh, Carlesson, uh, we, which was published in 2001 in Ergodic Theory Dynamical System, which is a kind of uh, uh, Dinger-Wolf uh, uh, theorem. Uh, for those of you who know the iteration in uh, in the unit disk, if we have a proper geodesic gram of hyperbolic metric space, um, and if we take a, a map which is one Lipschitz, so one Lipschitz means that it's uh, it does not expand the distance d. Okay, that's the definition. Um, then either there exists an orbit which is relatively compact inside uh, X, or the orbit converge in the gram of uh, sense to one point uh, in uh, in the boundary. So this point uh, C can be thought of as a dendro wolf point uh, of the map F. Uh, I will come back later in uh, in another context to this. Uh, with myself together with Hervé Gossier and uh, Andy Zimmer in, uh, in this paper appear in, uh, just appeared in 2020, we prove uh, um, th this result for uh, commuting uh, Lip one Lipschitz map. So if you have uh, two one Lipschitz map which are commuting in a gram of hyperbolic space, if they do have uh, different uh, uh, danger wolf point, this point at the boundary where the, the orbit converge, okay, then uh, uh, what happens is that there exists a totally geodesic closed subset of X and uh, a uh, one Lipschitz uh, retraction X, so it's uh, a map from X to, to this uh, totally geodesic closed subset M. Totally geodesic means that if you keep uh, two points in M, then the geodesic in X, which join these two points in M, uh, is all contained in M, in this sense, totally geodesic. So it uh, has this property, so it's a kind of projection, rho composed with rho is equal to rho, and uh, this M is fixed by both maps and the restriction are isometries of this space. Okay, this uh, uh, looks like uh, a. Oh. Okay, this looks like a technical result, but that's what we know on, uh, let's say, it, uh, dynamics uh, and commuting mappings in uh, uh, Gromo hyperbolic space. And and this result I will uh, I will tell maybe a little bit later uh, is used uh, not just for commuting mapping but also to prove uh, results on the Gromo boundary of spaces. Let me also mention this uh, Pythagoras theorem, which holds in, uh, um, in Gromo hyperbolic space. So, uh, yeah. So the usual Pythagoras theorem tells that if you keep three points, okay, z naught, pi z one, and z one, then the distance, uh, if you construct the square here plus the square here, this is equal to the square here. Okay. So that's the first Pythagoras theorem. And uh, th there is a, a second Pythagoras theorem which tells uh, the following, the, the, the second uh, uh, Pythagoras theorem, which tells that in fact uh, uh, Z naught minus Z1 is equal to Z1 minus pi Z1 plus uh, uh, pi Z1 minus Z naught. And uh, what's the proof of this theorem? You just uh, construct this uh, um, stair here. So what's the length uh, of this stair? But, well, it's just uh, this part here, which is just this, plus uh, this part here, which is just this. 
and now you, you make it smaller and smaller. And then you pass to the limit and you get uh, the, the second Pythagoras theorem, okay? Then, uh, of, co of course, this is, uh, this is false. But uh, what is good is that in uh, hyperbolic geometry, the second Pythagoras theorem in uh, Gromov uh, geometry is almost true. And uh, le let me first uh, give uh, an interpretation of Pythagoras theorem. I do the following. I consider a point uh, and now P of Z1 and this one uh, is a geodesic, the Euclidean geodesic, which joins Z0 with pi of Z1. And then I take another point, uh, sorry, I, I consider uh, here uh, a, a line, which is a geodesic for the Euclidean distance, and here the point Z1. What is this point that I call pi Z1? It's nothing but the orthogonal projection. And what is the orthogonal projection? This point here is the closest point to Z1. Okay, so here is Z1, and this is the closest point in the Euclidean metric on this geodesic from Z1. So this one is essentially the, um, the, the orthogonal projection is the closest projection, is the Euclidean projection of Z1. And now we do the same in hyperbolic geometry. So we fix uh, a geodesic. Now we have uh, XD, a gram of hyperbolic space. We fix a point Z0, a point Z1, and we consider pi Z1, which is the um, metric projection what, what is this? This is the, the point which realizes the minimum distance of uh, uh, Z1, sorry, um, Z1, Z1 from uh, this geodesic, okay? And now, uh, the, the, the magic is that uh, if the space is Gromov of hyperbolic, if you compute the distance from here to here, not the square, but really the distance from here to here, this is essentially the sum of this distance plus this distance, up to a, a universal constant which depends only on x. So you have uh, the, the triangular inequality tells that the distance from here to here is less than the distance of this plus this, but Grom of hyperbolicity implies that the distance of this plus this up to a constant which depends only on x and not on z0, gamma, or z1, is uh, uh, you have this inequality. So essentially the second uh, Pythagoras theorem is uh, almost true in uh, hyperbolic geometry. Okay, um, now let me enter in complex analysis. So I want to consider the Kobayashi metric. You can consider and it perfectly makes sense uh, any other uh, metric like uh, Bergman metric, Aratidori metric. And in fact, uh, uh, some questions are not known or at least I don't know question that might come out naturally from uh, from this cont contest for different metrics. So I consider Kobayashi metric. What is a Kobayashi metric? Uh, I guess that more or less all of you know, but I let me just uh, briefly recall the definition. So we have a complex manifold. Uh, we take a point in uh, in this complex manifold and a, 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 compl and a, a tangent vector. So if uh, x is, is a domain, then it means that v is just uh, a, a vector in Cn, okay? So I do consider all possible analytic disk, namely holomorphic map from the unit disk into X, which has the property that the point zero is mapped to Z naught, and the differential of uh, phi, I mean, the phi is uh, parallel to the vector V, okay? With some uh, lambda uh, strictly positive. You can reduce to lambda strictly positive by using rotation of the unit disk. And then I, I consider the infimum of one over lambda, of all possible disk that I put. Uh, what does it mean, this, this definition? It means that uh, the biggest, the bigger the disk is, the smaller the distance, the metric is, the norm is. Because the, the more you, you can stretch the, the, the disk, the, the, the more this number lambda becomes bigger and bigger, and so one over lambda becomes smaller and smaller. So in particular in Cn, if you do in Cn or in C, you get identically zero at every point. So this is what we call the Kobayashi pseudo metric. Um, in the in the unit disk, you can compute using uh, uh, automorphism. You can compute that the value is uh, exactly this one. So in the in the unit disk, uh, the Kobayashi pseudo metric is exactly the Poincaré norm, the Poincaré metric of a vector. Okay, the usual, the, the standard one. Um, th this one, you see, I just define. Uh, I call it. Kobayashi pseudo metric, but in fact it's just a norm, so it's a Finsler metric. It's not really a scalar product at the point. In the, in the case of the unit disk, you can uh, this comes from uh, 
from a scalar product from a Riemannian uh, metric also in the ball, but in other domain, uh, this does not. So it has this. And now when you have a Finsler metric, so when you have uh, the possibility of defining a norm of vector at each point of a tangent space in a continuous way, then you can define the length of a curve. So you take a curve in X, which is Lipschitz. Uh, you, you can even take absolutely continuous, but let's say Lipschitz is fine. Uh, so the length of this curve is just the integral of the Kobayashi norm along, uh, along the curve. And now you define uh, the, the distance between two points just to take the infimum among uh, all possible curves which join two points. So you fix two points, you consider all possible uh, path, continuous path, um, Lipschitz path co or continue, um, uh, joining the, the, these two points, and then you, you take the infimum of the length and this uh, gives the uh, Kobayashi pseudo distance. I say pseudo because it might happen that if you have two points, like in C, if you have two different points, then the distance might be zero. So you say that this is really a distance or it's really a metric, the infinitesimal uh, metric, if and only if uh, it's uh, the, 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 if you have a vector which is different from zero, then uh, the norm is different from zero, which is equivalent to say that the distance of two different points is different from zero. And in fact, uh, um, essentially this come, goes back to, to the Schwarz lemma. If you have a holomorphic map of uh, a complex manifold into itself, then it always decreases the uh, Kobayashi metric and the Kobayashi distance and you get the quality if you have uh, an automorphism. So it's a, it's a metric we contract the distance. It, it can be proved that in fact the Kobayashi uh, distance or metric is the, um, the biggest one among those which are contracted by holomorphic map. Okay, and this is just what I said, uh, uh, this definition that X is Kobayashi hyperbolic if uh, you get the uh, norm zero, if and only if the vector is zero, and uh, um, we call X uh, complete hyperbolic if uh, XKX is a complete uh, metric space. Now, it turns out by one of the various uh, version of the so-called Opferinov theorem that if you have uh, a complete metric space, then it is also geodesic. So if we have uh, a complete hyperbolic, uh, Kobayashi complete hyperbolic metric space, uh, complex space, then uh, it is also geodesic. So here comes the, the question. First question is, uh, which complete hyperbolic domains, at least I stay with domains, uh, are uh, Gromov hyperbolic? Second question, uh, if you do have uh, a Gromov hyperbolic domain, when there is a natural homeomorphism between the Gromov boundary, so the Gromov uh, uh, topological space, and the Euclidean uh, closure or the end compatification of D if it is unbounded, I won't uh, enter into the definition of this be because of uh, lack of time, but you, you might, if you don't know what the end compatification is, just think about uh, a bounded domain and then you take the Euclidean compatification. And then mainly is, okay, these are natural question and might be interesting by itself, but why they are important? So that's the, the question. Um, so one, one thing that I really don't know the answer is, uh, um, how spread is Gromov hyperbolicity among uh, co um, Kobayashi complete hyperbolic manifold uh, or even domains? And this is a hard question to say in, uh, in any sense. So I really don't know. It, was, uh, it can be proved, for instance, easily that if you have uh, a homogeneous hyperbolic uh, manifold, if it is Gromov hyperbolic, then it's bilomorphic to the ball. So for homogeneous domain, uh, for homogeneous complex manifold, is, uh, the, the answer is essentially trivial. But in general, that my, th there are other, other answers. So let me go to some answer to question one and two, which are uh, which domain are uh, Gromov hyperbolic and when the, the boundary is, by, is homeomorphic to the natural boundary. The unit disk, uh, as I already said, is Gromov hyperbolic. And in fact, the identity extend uh, as an homeomorphism between the Gromov topology and the Euclidean topology. What is this? Uh, homeomorphism, how, how can you construct? Well, as we said, if you start from the origin, there is only one uh, geodesic uh, which goes out from this uh, up to any point on the boundary. So if you fix a point sigma, there is only one geodesic ray landing to sigma. So you keep this geodesic ray, which gives uh, an equivalence class in the Gromov uh, sense, so a Gromov uh, boundary point, and you associate the landing point uh, sigma. 
So you, this, this map is one to one and it's not difficult to show that it, it's going to be an homeomorphism. So the identity extend uh, in this sense. Uh, also the unit ball, if you take the unit ball in CN with the Kobayashi uh, matrix, this is uh, um, Kobayashi complete hyperbolic and uh, it's Gromo hyperbolic and also the identity extend. To show, uh, let me tell, to show that uh, the, the unit disk is gromov hyperbolic, uh, it's not really difficult. You, if you do by contradiction, it's very simple. Um, to get the best constant, to see what is the best constant for the unit disk to, the grom, to be gromov hyperbolic, that's uh, another story. I mean, that's going to be complicated. Uh, it was proved by, in uh, 2000 by Balog and Bonk, uh, Zoltan Balog and Mario Bonk, that every strongly pseudoconvex domain with C2 boundary is gromov hyperbolic and the identity extend as an homeomorphism from the closure of the domain into the gromov closure of, um, of this. Um, also, in uh, there is this uh, uh, result which is, uh, I think, very interesting. If you have a convex, so not pseudo-convex, but convex domain, which is gromov hyperbolic, and I'm, when, I, when I talk about gromov hyperbolic, I always mean using the Kobayashi metric, okay? So if you have a convex domain, which is gromov hyperbolic, then the boundary, the boundary might not be regular. Here I'm not assuming any regularity of the boundary, not even the domain to be bounded. What you can prove is that the boundary does not contain any analytic disk. It is not hard to, to see that if you have a, a convex domain and if it contains an analytic disk, then it has to contain an affine uh, complex disk because of convexity. But, and then uh, Gromov hyperbolicity um, has this property. This was proved uh, first for bounded smooth bounded uh, domain, convex domain by Hervé Gossier and uh, Seshadri. And, uh, and, but, but then because of this game of uh, publishing paper, this appeared in uh, uh, 2018 and then uh, the general case was proved by Andy Zimmer in 2017. Um, what is the basically the, the idea, I'm not, I'm not giving any proof of this, but consider the by disk. Okay, the by disk is convex and it has uh, a, a disk on the boundary and it's not gromov hyperbolic. So what happens is that if you keep two sequences going in this direction, then here the distance is, uh, uh, is finite, although they go to different points uh, on the boundary. And so out of here, uh, you, you, can, uh, you can eventually create uh, a, um, a triangle uh, which is going to be a geodesic triangle uh, which does not satisfy the um, the, the gram of the thinness of gram of uh, uh, condition. So in particular if you have a convex domain which has an analytic disk uh, it has kind of disk here inside so if you move a little bit the disk inside uh, you create a by disk and then since you have this by disk then the distance here uh, uh, repeats more or less the same game. So this is very very roughly idea but the, ma the main the main point is the by disk uh, is a bad domain for gromov hyperbolicity and then whenever you resemble in some sense the gromov the, the by disk then uh, you don't have gromov hyperbolicity um also if uh, um yeah in uh, in case you have uh, a convex bounded domain with a uh, uh, smooth boundary in uh, in this in the same paper in uh, 2000 uh, well in another paper in 2016 uh, and the Zimmer proved that gromov hyperbolicity for, con co for convex bounded C infinity uh, smooth bounded domain, gromov hyperbolicity is equivalent to B of uh, D'Angelo finite type. So it means that there are no analytic disks which touch the boundary up to infinite order. There is a, a maximum order of contact. That's the morally the definition of D'Angelo finite type. So this uh, uh, and this uh, result, which you see is a kind of generalization of this result here, convexity and no boundaries, no regularity on the boundary, on the boundary just force not to have uh, analytic disk. But if you have, as, as soon as you have a smooth boundary, then you can use uh, a, a scaling property 
And using this scaling property, if you have a point of infinite type, you can create uh, a by disk and then you get in trouble. Um, using this kind of argument, uh, it's not completely direct, but maybe it's good to mention this result here. Together with uh, uh, the same Andy Zimmer and Hervé Gossier, we prove a couple of years ago that if you have a convex bounded uh, smooth domain, then if there exists uh, a Keller metric on D, which is complete, uh, and uh, whose uh, holomorphic bisectional curvature is negatively pinched close to the boundary, then uh, it's going to be chromofiberbolic. The converse is not known. I mean, the, the converse going from uh, chromofiberbolic to, to condition on uh, natural Keller or Keller-Einstein metric on the domain, this is not known for the moment, but at least we have uh, a direction. Um, yeah, and then uh, we prove uh, just recently in this paper in 2020, still with uh, Hervé and Andy, that if you have a convex domain, no matter how regular is the boundary, nor if it is bounded or not, then the identity always extends as an homeomorphism between the Gromov closure, if it is Gromov hyperbolic, then the identity extends uh, as an uh, homeomorphism from the closure of the Gromov, uh, uh, in, the, in the Gromov sense, uh, to the end compatification of the domain. So if the domain is bounded, it's just the, the Euclidean closure. And I want to mention uh, a re recent result, very recent, by Matteo Fiacchi, um, one of my PhD students from uh, Tor Vergata, who proved that if you have in C2, if you have a bounded C infinity uh, smooth uh, finite type domain, no convexity assumption, then it is gromov hyperbolic and the identity extends uh, as an homeomorphism. So in C2, the convexity assumption can be dropped. In a higher dimension, we don't know. Now I come to, um, to three, to answering why it's important, uh, the, the, the answer to question one and two. The first is about iteration theory and commuting mapping. Uh, you might remember this theorem of Carlson that I mentioned. So if uh, whenever you have uh, a domain in CN, which is Kobayashi and Gromov hyperbolic, and the natural boundary is uh, homeomorphic to the Gromov boundary, uh, as I said, the uh, holomorphic self-map of D are contraction for the Kobayashi distance, so in particular they are one Lipschitz. And then uh, if the, there is no orbit, uh, there is a, uh, in fact just one point with orbit which is not relatively compact, then by Carlson there exists uh, only a, a unique point uh, on, uh, uh, sorry, here is the boundary. Okay, there exists uh, a unique point uh, on the boundary of the, the domain, in the uh, in the natural boundary, not in the, so that uh, this uh, the, the iterates converge to this point. Okay, this is because you you know by Carlson that everything converges to a point in the Gromov boundary, but the Gromov boundary is naturally homeomorphic to the natural boundary, so there is only one point, and it's the identity who makes this uh, homeomorphism. So when you stay inside, uh, it's exactly the same map, and then uh, this comes from this. And this point here you might call the danger wall of point. Uh, and, and the same you have uh, using my result with Andy Zimmer and Hervé Gossier, you can uh, generalize the so-called Ben Bean uh, result if you have two holomorphic self-map which are commuting uh, and uh, uh, the orbits are not relatively compact, then either they have the same danger wall point or there exists a holomorphic retract uh, which contain the two points uh, on the boundary so that the restriction here are automorphism. Now you might, if you know something about uh, iteration theory, you might say that this is not the end of the story because uh, one of the most uh, intriguing and uh, often very difficult part of the story is to say when is this condition not having orbit relatively compact satisfied? And uh, um, and in fact uh, the the conjecture, let's say, the hope is that you you have a relatively compact orbit if and only if there is a fixed point. This, in fact, is true if uh, for the unit disks, the ball of a convex domain, and here uh, Marco Abate wrote uh, a lot of papers about uh, different cases with different kind of regularity. Uh, the fuller, uh, I mean, for convex domain, uh, it's known this fact. Um, or uh, if the strongly pseudoconvex contractible and C3 boundary uh, quite curiously, there is no proof for C2 boundary of, uh, of this result. So, having and anyhow, having this uh, uh, Gromov hyperbolicity might be useful to, to prove uh, iteration theory, I mean, get result in iteration theory. The second uh, uh, natural uh, extension is, uh, is about extension theorem. 
if you take a bilomorphism between two domains, you ask uh, whether this map extends in some sense to the boundary. Now, uh, if I take D1 to be Kobayashi and Gromov hyperbolic, then since a bilomorphism is, is a, in a isometry between the Kobayashi distance of D1 and D2, then this means that also the second domain is Kobayashi and Gromov hyperbolic. Now, if the identity extend uh, in a natural way as an homeomorphism uh, up to the closure in the Euclidean and in the Gromov sense, then we do have this uh, commuting diagram. Here is the map, the original map F. Now the domain uh, is embedded in this two, and here the identity give us uh, a, um, an homeomorphism, and so we can extend here the map. And what is the map? I take a point here, I want to extend from, from this one. So I go back here, I go here, and I go here. And this gives the, the extension. And it's and that's going to be an homeomorphism. Okay, that's important. In particular, if you use the result I mentioned in the point one, uh, if D1 is a, a smooth, strongly bounded pseudo-convex domain, or a convex and Gromov hyperbolic domain, or a domain in C2, uh, smooth, bounded, and finite type, and if you get uh, a bilomorphism, and the image here is, uh, for instance, convex, with no boundary regularity, no boundedness of the domain uh, assumed, then the map always extends as an homeomorphism. So you don't need uh, any regularity condition to get uh, automatically extension as uh, an homeomorphism. Okay, here I, I prepare uh, a proof how to prove the, um, in, in the case of convex and bounded domain, why the, um, the Gromov boundary of D is uh, uh, homomorphic to the to the boundary itself, uh, and I but I, I might maybe by because of time I, I think I I might I might have something like maybe less than ten minutes, something between five and ten. Just about, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I might maybe come back to to, to this one uh, later. I want to. I want to convince why it's important to study Gromov hyperbolicity, so I prefer maybe to, to go on about uh, um, applications. Because there are also this application, which is, uh, uh, I mean, se seems uh, has nothing to do with, uh, uh, with Gromov hyperbolicity. Boundary behavior of conformal mapping. You take the a, a Riemann map between the unit disk and the simply connected domain. Now, if you keep a, a continuous map in, uh, inside the domain D, which goes to the boundary of the domain. Here I put uh, infinity to say it's a boundary in the Riemann sphere if the domain is unbounded. Then as a consequence, as a trivial consequence of the Fatou lemma, you get that the pre-image of this slit, this is called a slit. Now, if you have a continuous map in D, which arrive up to the boundary, here is the, let's say here is the, the domain. If you have something which goes up to here, it's called a slit. Then uh, the, the pre-image is a slit in the domain D in the sense that the F minus one of gamma converge to a boundary point in the disk. It's very easy to, to see once you know Fatou's lemma. Uh, so the question, however, is how can you say, uh, just look into the Euclidean geometry of D and the curve gamma, if this curve converge non-tangentially to the point sigma or radially? So why non-tangentially? Because uh, uh, Non-tangentially is uh, a very important condition. In many results, uh, when you study boundary behavior of uh, uh, holomorphic mapping from the unit disk or uh, of uh, conformal mapping, you have usually a dichotomy. You have uh, uh, some results about non-tangential limits, so non-tangential limits exist almost everywhere, non-tangential limits have this property, and blah, 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 and uh, nothing about uh, unrestricted uh, or uh, tangential limit. So non-tangential limits are very important. And non-tangential means that, uh, li like in this picture, here is a is point sigma, you have an angle, and my curve is eventually containing this angle. Okay, let me rephrase, uh, first of all, uh, this sentence. What does it mean that F minus one of gamma converge non-tangentially to sigma? This means, if you look to the to this geodesic ray, which arrived to sigma, sigma now in this picture is one, but whatever, and you look to the set of points which have a uh, hyperbolic distance less than uh, a given m, you really get an angle here. So converging non-tangentially means to stay at finite hyperbolic distance from uh, one and then any geodesic ray landing at this point. Now, you see, staying at finite distance from something is a, is a conformal invariant condition that you can move on domains. 
using the, the Riemann mapping because the Riemann mapping preserve hyperbolic uh, metric. And now by shadowing lemma, this condition can be even weakened by saying that the, the this uh, curve stay at uh, converge non-tangentially if and only if it is at finite distance from a quasi-geodesic which land at the same point sigma because a quasi-geodesic is by itself uh, at finite distance from uh, a geodesic. And uh, the, um, th there is also a technical note because uh, also landing at one point uh, is an extrinsic condition. The point is on the boundary, it's not intrinsic. So you can replace, if you want, you can rephrase this sentence landing at sigma by either saying that uh, uh, this uh, eta is, uh, is a geodesic and so you can represent uh, by, by considering the, the Gromov point. So sigma is uh, essentially the, given by, by the, the class, the Gromov class of uh, this geodesic. Or uh, in dimension one, you can use Karatedori prime and theory, which I'm not entering in here, which tells that eta, the, the geodesic, uh, converge in the Karatedori um, topology to, to the prime end defined by sigma. But anyhow, what is important is that f minus one of gamma converge non-tangentially if and only if gamma, so now gamma is in our domain D, stay at finite hyperbolic distance from a quasi-geodesic ray. And uh, uh, to tell how this uh, can be powerful, uh, and then I, I will end up with this, you um, consider a star-like domain at infinity. So star-like domain is a domain for which when you take a point and you move uh, upward in the vertical direction, then you continue staying in your domain. Now you keep a point P and you go up, and then at the, and then here you move uh, on the imaginary part. So this point is P plus IT, and then you look what you have uh, on the right. So here is the right distance from the domain. I make this picture uh, to be continuous, the boundary, just to, to, to understand better, but the boundary may not even be locally connected, okay? It can be whatever. I have no assumption at all. I can always define the, the right distance to be the distance uh, from uh, this point here to whatever uh, is contained on the right part uh, of the domain, okay? On the outside the domain, so here. And here we have the left distance. And now, what we prove in this paper with Manolo Contreras, Santiago Diaz Madrigal, Hervé Gossier, and Andy Zimmer, uh, already, I mean, published also this one in 2020, is that if you have this curve, if you have this domain, and if you move here by trying to stay in as possible in the middle of your domain, so you move at the time t, you, you keep uh, moving uh, delta plus minus delta minus. So if uh, your domain is something of this form, let's say if your domain goes uh, something like this, what you do, you start from uh, here, you stay in the middle, and then you tend to stay as possible in the, in the middle of uh, the domain. This is going to be, this curve here, is going to be a two Lipschitz quasi-geodesic for some uh, AB given, converging to infinity. So it goes be because it goes to infinity clearly. So in particular, uh, if you have a Riemann mapping to this domain, which is uh, star-like at infinity, then you can uh, you can define uh, what we call a continuous semigroup of holomorphic self-map by, by, by going first with Riemann mapping, then uh, translate up and then come back. And all holomorphic semigroup of uh, the unit disk with no interior fixed point are of this form. So by, by the danger wolf theorem, they do convert to, to a point at the, at the boundary, and the convergence is non-tangentially if and only if uh, the domain is almost symmetric in the sense that the what you have here and here is about the same, because what you are doing is uh, I have this curve, I, I take the pre-image and I want to understand if it converges non-tangentially or not. So I just look, if the domain is uh, almost symmetric, then uh, it's converging non-tangentially, and if it converges non-tangentially, then the domain is uh, almost symmetric. Uh, just to end up, this idea can be pushed forward to consider not only semigroup, and this is what I did with, with Oliver Roth recently, but to consider univalent self-map of the unit disk. Still, you can uh, you have the same result, so the, the convergence is, uh, um, oh, is non-tangentially, if and only if the, 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 the image domain of the Kenning function is uh, almost uh, symmetric. And here, uh, you have to use, uh, again, uh, to, to construct uh, uh, quasi-geodesic uh, and, uh, and to use that one. I, 
I won't enter uh, into the this last uh, slide, which uh, well maybe I just sketch. You can use also Gram of hyperbolicity to localize uh, hyperbolic distance, in the sense that if you have uh, something like a box uh, and your domain contain a box, uh, if the uh, eight of the box is uh, much bigger than the the weight of the the box, uh, then the hyperbolic geometry here inside is essentially the one of the strip where you know everything. And the way to prove it uh, is uh, exactly using Gromov of hyperbolicity. Okay, I think I uh, stop here and thank you very much for, uh, for, for the attention. Accendi il microfono a tutti. E no, io non posso, devono, devono accendersi da solo. <laughs> Grazie. Thank you, Filippo. Uh, I would like to see if there are questions for the speaker, for Filippo. Thanks for the very nice talk. So if you if you wish, please open your microphone and uh, and ask a question. Graziano? Filippo. Chi c'è? Prego. Okay, better. Ok, ho disattivato l'audio di tutti. Chi vuole intervenire, magari eh, wants to, to speak, unmute the, the audio and uh, just enter because otherwise it's uh, noisy. Filippo, it's Eleonora. Ciao. Ciao. So, thanks a lot for the talk. It was inspiring. So, I have like a lot of questions, but maybe I will, I will restrict them. <laughs> Can I? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, just like at the beginning where you defined your uh, gram of compatification at the very, very beginning. Mm -hmm. So like for a metric space. So we are on a metric space. So do we know that also like this compatification is a metric space as well? Yes, it's metrizable. It's, it's metrizable. It's, metri it's metrizable. Okay, and I never, I never use the, the metric in fact there. So I know that you can do, and that there are different ways to define uh, Grom of hyperbolicity using sequences, the Grom of product. Maybe you heard this name. I didn't use it here and I did not uh, talk about that. It's uh, in, uh, if the space is Grom of hyperbolic, the two definitions are the same and, uh, and then you can define the distance. So not, not using, uh, not really using the, the geodesic, but using sequences. Oh, okay, so if the, the metric space is gromo, gromo hyperbolic, hyperbolic, then the compa okay, then the yes, then the compatibility is metrizable, and but to make the, the metric, you have to to define uh, these using uh, sequences. So you have the what people call the gram of product. You have two sequences going to infinity, which is more or less the idea to define orosphere. It's uh, you, you fix a point, you look to the distance. Uh, from this point to one sequence to from this point to another sequence and the distance between the two. And you say that the two sequences are uh, uh, equivalent if uh, this, uh, the, the distance between the twice the distance between the two minus the, the distance of the first from this fixed point, the second from the fixed point converge to infinity. And then and then you can define uh, a matrix. Is, uh, Okay, and, but then uh, do you know also something about completeness? So let's say that we start with the metric space that is complete. Do you know also if where, where you end up this compatibility? Uh, yes, 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 because it's going to be compact. It's a compact. The ah, gram of compatibility okay, so is compact. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if I wrote here. In okay. Any, it's compact. Okay. And then, so uh, another question about uh, with this is this gram of hyperbolic condition preserved under gram of Asdorf convergence? Uh, gram uh, gram of what is which is the gram of house of you mean by of a compact uh, of sets or something like that yes the gram of uh, uh, yeah yeah that, that's um, uh, that, that's subtle and i don't think they um, well okay let, let me give you the, the, you, you can construct counter example if uh, uh, so it's not okay in the sense that uh, you can construct a uh, Objects which are uh, um, gromos, uh, just say Hausdorff converging. So because uh, Hausdorff convergence is about uh, uh, compact uh, compact set, right? Yes. Okay. So I mean, in, in that case, you you don't need to to construct the boundary because it's already compact. Yeah. 
the uh, I mean, uh, it doesn't make sense. You don't have geodesic ray which converge to, to infinity. I would say is uh, you get the, the space F. So if you have a, an open set and you consider the, the uh, let's say in, in CN, if you have uh, um, even Stein domains, you consider the closure. If these are gram of hyperbolic, then uh, uh, they, if they do they do converge in the outdoor sense, it's the closure of the domain. But the closure of the domain, they might not converge to a, a Stein domain or uh, even to a domain in uh, in the outdoor sense. Like if you have a ball and you have a kind of uh, stuff here and you get thinner and thinner and thinner. I don't know if I answer your question, but I... Yeah. I mean, so we, we, you think we, that it's not. You think that they, one can because you you could talk for about convex, graph for one, convex so. domain is true. For convex domain is true, and the, in fact, is uh, is the reason why most of the results uh, only arrive up to convex domain exactly because the Hausdorff convergence works well for convex domain, but not in general. But indeed, I wanted to ask you this n compatification because you define these two compatification, the Gaumas one and this I don't know this the infinity the one. N compatification, yes. So is this one defined only for domain of scan or this is something more general? No, this is something more general. If you have a compact space, it uh, it's just a compact space, but otherwise you can define. It's uh, for for convex domain, for instance, it's just uh, the the number of uh, uh, of ends. Like uh, if you have a parabola, then you have just one one point at infinity. If you have a cylinder, you have two points, and you consider one and the other. You want to consider them to be different. Okay, so maybe last question for today. <laughs> um, when you you mentioned your uh, pre your paper with uh, Gossier Zimmer, the one in 2018, the one about like uh, the the um, the Keller uh, when you have yeah, a yeah. domain Keller many uh, Keller many metric. Yeah, I, sh the... I shouldn't have to do that if I knew that you you are used... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, too late. Uh, so what would be like the compact version of this? Uh, what, what do you mean by no, mean, if you like a compact manifold, for example. No, but compact manifold, uh, no, here, uh, OK, the point here is different. The point is that what we, we really prove is the following. If you have a, a convex domain, even if it's unbounded uh, or uh, it has no smooth boundary, even if the boundary is bad, uh, I mean, as bad as can be for a convex domain, of course, and if the domain is unbounded, uh, if if does not contain uh, any complex line in, inside, which is equivalent to be hyperbolic, the question of the existence of such a Keller uh, metric with uh, um, pinch, uh, negatively pinch uh, um, holomorphic bisectional curvature near the boundary uh, implies that there are no analytic disks on the boundary. And this, the, the reason why we were studying this result was because there was a result of Paul Young in the 70s who proved that for the bi disk there are no Keller metric with, with such a property. So we generalized the, his result by saying that, well, here the main point is about having analytic disk on the boundary, which is a condition which is uh, very much related to Gromov of hyperbolic space, but it's not uh, really the issue there was not the Gromov of uh, hyperbolicity, or at least was not direct the, the Gromov of hyperbolicity. So for uh, for the compact case, uh, I don't know what to answer because here uh, the, the point is that you, you want to have something which is close to, to the boundary, so it means outside the compact set. Yeah, indeed, because I don't know what this, because in in, Keller, in the compact case for Keller manifold, there are results that characterize the manifold depending on condition of the bisectional or morphy mm -hmm. bisectional mm -hmm. or whatever. But then the, there is no, I mean, I don't know what this pinch uh, condition close to blah, to the boundary means. This means so, just okay. that you have, uh, you have your domain, which is convex, okay? And here you have a compact set. You have uh, the the you have G, which is a Keller metric, complete yeah. Keller metric inside the domain. But you know that the um, you only know that the holomorphic bisectional curvature is negatively pinched outside a compact set. Uh, so you don't have any information inside. No, 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 no. We just know that we have a domain, open yeah. domain, yeah. and we yeah. have a Keller metric which is complete, and uh, outside the compact set, uh, the um, the, the, the bisectional curve, the holomorphic bisectional curve is negatively pinch. That's uh, that's the meaning of uh, close to the boundary. So the boundary, the, there is no boundary. In fact, we, we don't use the boundary at all. Okay. In the sense that we, it's an extrinsic condition. In uh, intrinsic terms, means that outside the compact set, you have uh, those conditions. Oh, okay, but, but then, 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 then maybe include somebody else in the conversation. Sorry. 
Sorry. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but maybe maybe somebody else wants to ask. I something. have a question. Can you hear me? It's Gian Maria. Yes, Ciao, Gian Maria. Ciao, Gian. I have a couple of questions. One is about counterexamples. So uh, you said that convex in the category of convex domains, uh, presence of analytic disks precludes uh, gram of hyperbolicity. And what about other counterexamples? And the second question is about um, the smooth extendability to the to the boundary. So you said that in, for example, in the convex case, even without regularity of the boundary, you got a homeomorphic extension. Uh, and this is definitely something different than the typical smooth extension. But yes. can you recover, for example, the classical Pfefferman extension? OK, I, yeah, I yeah, know. OK, the, um, yeah, uh, counterexample to Grom of uh, hyperbolicity, what uh, this is not, uh, it's, um, it's a work in progress uh, together with uh, Hervé Gossier and uh, Leandro Rosio. We basically, we can prove that if you have a domain which is containing something like uh, a tube, so it's uh, something like uh, D times C, if you have a domain which goes to, to infinity and then uh, your domain is containing D times C and contains something which is like uh, dr times uh, well uh, maybe t t t times some uh, some space h uh, when r uh, for every r tends to one so whenever uh, okay let, let me be a little bit slow in the sense that if you cut here if you take yeah. r uh, uh, let's say one half so you have to cut very far away here and then you know that uh, the, your domain contains all this kind of cylinder from this point on and so on then this domain is not Grom of hyperbolic. That's what uh, more or less we, we have uh, up to some details, it should be true. So this might be another kind of uh, example of domains which are not uh, uh, Grom of hyperbolic. There are examples, in fact, of domains which are not convex, but are C convex, but uh, not smooth uh, uh, regularity the boundary, whose boundary contain analytic disk, but still are Grom of hyperbolic. This was a result by an example of uh, Andy. So the, the having analytic disk, uh, it really uh, useful uh, in on the boundary. It's really useful when you have a convex domain. If the domain is not convex, then this is not a good condition. Um, so it's more like uh, uh, this is a more like uh, a, a condition of uh, uh, checking whether your domain is containing something or uh, it contains the other and so on. As for the second question, uh, um, I never, in fact, I never work on a, a better extension because the uh, the point is that as, as soon as you have uh, a, some uh, good regularity on the boundary and if you have a proper map, then there are a lot of results about the CR geometry, which allows you to get some kind of extension. But in fact, you are right that uh, uh, there was um, uh, Luca Capogna and uh, um, Ah, uh, okay. The, the other guy, okay, okay. Yeah, the, okay, I forgot the name. The, the, they prove uh, using Balog and Bonk, they, they went to, to check better the estimates of Balog and Bonk. And so they reproved, they gave uh, a, another proof of um, uh, Pfefferman theorem using by, by, by checking carefully how the, the real geodesic do extend up to the boundary. So in fact, you can use uh, Grom of hyperbolicity and uh, to to study also better kind of extension because you are right if you if you know that the that your that your domain is Grom of hyperbolic and you know that the geodesic the real geodesic do extend with some regularity at the boundary then you get the same regularity for biomorphism. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? I have a short one. You, you never spoke uh, of pseudo convexity, uh, but a lot of, of convexity, but not pseudo convexity. Yeah. So, for instance, when you mention, you talk about domains of finite type, are those pseudo convex? Yeah, I, I guess I guess I I forgot to write, but they they, they are they, they are pseudo convex. Well, you want to have uh, Grom of, um, you want to have uh, um, complete hyperbolicity, Kobayashi hyperbolicity. So I think that. Uh, uh, well, bounded finite type domain, uh, they are uh, usually they, they yeah, are supposed they, to be pseudo convex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think maybe they are always by the continuance as no. Well, it depends how you define finite type, but I guess you, yeah. you can force the analytic disk to stay inside. Yeah, well, and, uh, depends on how you define it, but it's still in general, I think uh, there are, you assume, one assumes uh, pseudo convexity from the beginning. 
pseudo-convex domain of finite type. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. It's uh, yeah. You yeah. You have to assume because, for instance, if you take the ball and you remove a smaller a ball of smaller radius, then uh, this you might say that it's a finite type because it, yeah, <laughs> it's strongly pseudo-convex. In a, if you just look at the boundary, but it's not pseudo-convex. So yes. Yeah, I think I forgot to to, to mention there the the result of Matteo. I think you need the uh, yeah. pseudo-convex. Maybe if Matteo is here, he can tell better. Yeah, Matteo is seems to be. Present? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, we, you need the pseudo convexity. Yeah. Okay. So. Thank you. Are other questions? Well, uh, I think we can thank uh, Philip again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we, Again, we 